You're listening to Let's Talk Creation, the science podcast that's just for you. Well, welcome back to another episode of Let's Talk Creation with Todd and Paul. I am Todd Wood. And I'm Paul Garner. And we are here to chat about all manner of creation-related subjects. This week, Paul, we're picking up an, uh, a series that we started uh, probably a couple months ago. Um, we've got a couple of these intermittent series running. One is on Great Discoveries in Creation Science. This one is about radiometric dating. And so mm-hmm. listeners may remember uh, episode 26. Um, and what was the analogy we used in that episode, Paul? Do you remember? Uh, it was a dripping tap. Yeah. Or, um, to translate, a dripping faucet. <laughs> right. <laughs> dripping tap, dripping yes. faucet. It's all the same stuff. It's all that... Yeah, babble babel confusion again. So yeah, we're very, we're very transatlantic here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So yeah. So we gave a very vague uh, we gave a very vague introduction last time. Uh, yeah. Vague. I wouldn't say it was vague. It was more generalized. The idea of how you would measure these these sorts of things and the, the sort of logic and reasoning that goes into this radiometric dating. This episode is all about radioactivity. And we have a very special guest with us today, uh, Ben Clausen, who is a staff scientist at Geoscience Research Institute. Uh, ben has a master's degree in geology and a PhD in physics and has a long track record of research in this area. Uh, looking at radioactivity and things called isotopes and dating. And Ben, thank you for being with us. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. So, goodness, I'm I'm feeling a bit, uh, uh, yeah, out of my league here. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be the voice of the audience trying to get it back down to the ground where we can understand what's going on. So. My, my, and, and that's funny because, you know, I have a PhD in biochemistry, so I spent a lot of time working with, well, a lot of time, I spent some time working with radioactive materials in grad school. And we, you know, we learned about the basics and we learned about radio, radioactive safety, right? Radioactivity and safety procedures and what you should do. And we, we, I've used... Let's see, I used some radioactive hydrogen at one point. I used uh, some radioactive phosphorus at one point. Um, we were always quite nervous about the phosphorus, uh, P32. We were, I wouldn't want to say flippant about the radioactive hydrogen, but um, it was, people would tell me, oh yeah, you're, the clothes you're wearing is probably going to stop any radiation you're getting from from hydrogen. Uh can you tell us what exactly is this stuff? Why is why is it dangerous? What is it? Can you tell me the difference between alpha, beta, and gamma radiation? Can you just sort of get us started into what this is? Uh, so they use the Greek alphabet to talk about the different radiation, alpha, beta, and gamma. Um, when they were first looking at it, they didn't know exactly what alpha, beta, and gamma radiation was. But uh, now we know that the alpha particles are basically a helium nucleus, two protons and two neutrons. Uh, Beta decay or beta radiation is electrons. And gamma radiation is not particles, it's electromagnetic uh, waves, electromagnetic rays. Uh, The most energetic ones are like light waves or infrared or x-rays, but gamma rays are even more energetic than than any of those are. Um, So alpha particles, uh, two two protons and two neutrons, um, they can be very dangerous, but they're very easily shielded. Um, All it takes is like a piece of paper to shield those. And so um, 
if you get the alpha particles inside you, if you get the radioactive material inside you, it can be very dangerous. But if it's outside you, you can easily shield. Uh, beta particles, electrons are a little bit harder to shield, but usually you can use, you know, plastic or a thin piece of aluminum or, or something fairly thin, a clothes maybe um, will shield you from beta radiation. Um, gamma rays though are much more penetrating. Um, they can go through clothes. Uh, they can even go through a little bit of lead. But so for radiation there, you need lots of lead or lots of concrete or lots of water um, for radiation, uh, for shielding from gamma radiation. Okay, so so you mentioned um, neutrons, protons, and electrons. You want to rewind a little bit and tell us what those are? Just remind everybody what we're talking okay. about here. So hopefully people remember a little bit from maybe chemistry class in high school that uh, you have atoms, the fundamental building blocks of nature and atoms are made up of electrons that uh, are in shells uh, around the atom, uh, the electron shells. And then inside the atom, there's a nucleus. And in the nucleus, you have protons and neutrons. And so something like carbon, that's, uh, we all know about carbon. Uh, carbon has um, its element number six. So it has six protons and six neutrons, um, or, or six protons and six electrons. In addition, uh, inside the nucleus, it has neutrons. Most carbon has six neutrons, but sometimes you can have seven neutrons or eight neutrons. Um, so electrons are negatively charged, protons are positively charged, they balance each other. And then you have neutrons in addition that, um, are usually about the same number as the number of protons, but for the heavier elements, you get lots more neutrons than you do protons inside the nucleus. Hmm. Okay. So, so, yeah, Paul? I, I was just going to say, Ben, uh, so basically an element is um, essentially a substance that, that atoms that have the same number of protons. Is, is, is that right? It's based on the number of protons. So um, yeah. each of the different elements... Uh, has a different number of protons. That's right. Yeah. But then there are these things called isotopes, which are different forms or species of an element. And they also have the same number of protons, but they have different numbers of neutrons. Is that right? So that's that's your the example you gave there with, with carbon, for example. There are these different varieties of carbon that have different so numbers of neutrons. So for, for carbon, the most common one is carbon-12, which has six protons and six neutrons that adds up to 12. 1% um, of carbon is carbon-13. So 1% has six protons and seven neutrons. And then a very, very, very small fraction of carbon is carbon-14, and it has six protons and eight neutrons. Um, another example is uranium. Uranium has uh, 92 protons, but it has lots and lots and lots of neutrons. And so you have uranium-235 and uranium-238. And most uranium is uranium-238, but a little bit less than 1% of uranium is uranium-235. And you probably hear in the news about uranium enrichment, and so you have to enrich uranium so that um, it can be used in a nuclear reactor or enriched even more if you want to put it in bombs. And so enrichment means that you're changing the ratio of the isotopes, uranium-235 and uranium-238. Well, I hope everybody's following that. <laughs> I don't think it's too terribly difficult yet. That is high school chemistry. And hopefully all my students uh, who took chemistry with me, and there are not many of them, but I hope you do remember your basic uh, <laughs> nuclear um, construction there. And, and, and we might also mention the nucleus of the, of the atom is where we get the word nuclear when we talk about a nuclear reactor. And it, it is not a nuclear reactor. It is nuclear 
nuclear. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about you, but that's always a big pet peeve of mine. You hear people talk about yeah. nuclear. <laughs> yeah, mine too. Yeah, drives me crazy. Anyway, all right, well... So we've got this nucleus, and inside the nucleus there are protons that are positively charged, there are neutrons that have no charge, and on the shells around uh, the atom are the uh, electrons, which have a negative charge. And generally speaking, by convention, we would say a proton, at least in chemistry, we would say a proton has one positive charge, and an electron has one negative charge. And the other thing that we know from our high school physics is that uh, charges uh, have a certain uh, attributes, right? So like charges repel and, and opposite charges attract. Opposites attract and like charges repel. So, uh, and if you, you know, you remember from your high school, I'm sure everybody remembers from high school, that Van de Graaff generator, that weird looking metal ball on a stick and you put your hand on it and your hair stands up because it's building up a lot of electrons and it's causing you it's it's causing your hair to repel um so how is it and this is <laughs> this is sort of a legitimate question for me i think i know the answer but how is it that you have a bunch of positively charged protons in the nucleus, all stuck together. What's causing, what's keeping them together? Shouldn't they be flying apart and coming apart? What's the deal with that? So this is a question that um, people often don't think about. You take chemistry and you learn about attraction between electrons and protons. And so in chemistry, that's all you worry about. Uh, and that's the electromagnetic force. The electromagnetic force talks about repulsion between like charges and attraction between opposite charges. Um, so yes, you have all these protons that are like charges. So how do they stick together inside the nucleus? And um, that is not a chemistry question, it seems. That's a high energy question. And so that ends up being a physics question. So apparently there must be a force that's even stronger than the electromagnetic force. So the electromagnetic force causes repulsion in the nucleus. And so this other force that holds them together, for want of a better word, is just called the strong force. Uh, that's not very creative, but uh, it's just called the strong force. So this strong force works at very short distances. And at longer distances, it rapidly decreases to the point that between the nucleus and another nucleus of another atom nearby, the amount of the strong force is negligible, whereas the weak force could still have a significant impact. Um, so this strong force is what holds the protons together inside the nucleus. And the strong force works on the neutrons and the protons both. Um, and so to be able to hold the nucleus together with the strong force, you need to have lots of neutrons as well as protons to overcome the repulsive force um, of the electromagnetic force between the protons. So your light elements like carbon, oxygen, phosphorus, sodium, and so forth, have approximately the same number of protons as neutrons. But once you get to heavier and heavier nuclei, uh, you need more and more neutrons. And so even though uranium has 92 protons, it has a whole bunch more neutrons. Like, I think it's maybe like 140 neutrons, uh, something like that, to hold the um, uranium atom, the uranium nucleus together. So the strong force is what holds the protons together in the nucleus. Okay. So is that then the thing? So let's just back up here a second. So you talked about the alpha and the beta and the gamma. So alpha particles are a, a single unit that is that composed of two neutrons and two protons. And it gets, it, it's moving, I guess. And then a beta particle is an electron. It's equivalent to an electron. <clears throat> and then there's this gamma radiation. So 
are those things coming from a nucleus somewhere, some kind of nucleus? Is that what that is? Uh, so, yes. Okay. So, for example, something like uranium, that's one of the um, atoms that's used in radiometric dating. Uh, uranium decays through a series of steps to lead, and it gives off a series of alpha particles. That's right. Okay. Um, and so it gives off two protons and two neutrons each time it gives off an alpha particle. Um, so the atomic number keeps on decreasing from lead, which is uh, uranium, which is 92, down to lead, which is 82. So I, ha I have a chart of the nuclides on my wall here. Excellent. So I was just looking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So yes. So for alpha particles, um, you, you, it gives off two protons and two neutrons. Okay. Another one that is uh, sometimes used in radiometric dating is rubidium decaying to strontium. And it gives off an electron. And in the process of giving off an electron, um, it gives off a negative particle. And so inside the nucleus, you get a change between a a neutron and a proton, and so it changes the atomic number from uh, rubidium-87 to strontium-87. So that's a, um, it, it changes what the atom is. So it gives off a beta particle, an electron. The third kind of radiation is gamma rays, and often when you uh, have radiation, uh, when you give off these particles, it also gives off some radiation as well. Not always, but but often it'll give off particles plus radiation. Wow. It's so you you said that when a beta particle is given off, a a neutron, it does it convert to a proton? Does it become a proton? Is that what's happening? Uh basically, yeah. So yeah. It's, it's funny to me because, you know, in chemistry, we just teach people, you know, you get down to the nucleus. That's it. You can't you can't change that. That's what you got. And uh, yeah, for the first approximation for chemists, that's probably good enough. Yeah. Uh, yeah. First approximation, the neutron changes to a proton. OK, well, there you go. And now, you know, uh, um, <laughs> so can we predict when a nucleus is so so I guess. Let me back up again here. I'm going to keep my ideas straight. So we have this nucleus. The nucleus is shooting off particles and rays as it, you call it, it's decaying? Is it breaking down? Are those the right terms? That's that's the term that's used. Decay, okay, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so a single nucleus decays and shoots out a particle and becomes a different element altogether. Um, why? <laughs> why why are some things perfectly safe i would guess most of the stuff in my room is not radioactive and is perfectly safe why is it that some things are are falling apart what's the deal uh so in general you're right most atoms are stable and they don't decay however you do have a few atoms inside your body that are not stable so potassium for example is most potassium atoms are stable, but a few of them are not. There's potassium-40 that is radioactive, and it has a very long half-life, so not very much of it decays during a person's lifetime. Um, but yes, so why are some atoms, why are some nuclei stable and some are not? So if the strong force is strong enough to hold the nucleus together in contrast to the electromagnetic force, which is trying to push the protons apart, then it's stable. But if the strong force is not strong enough and the electromagnetic force is too strong, then it will decay. And if the electromagnetic force is very strong, you wouldn't even have an atom at all. And so I have the chart of the nuclides on my wall that shows like um, a couple thousand different nuclides, a couple thousand different isotopes. Um, most of the ones on the chart uh, are unstable. There's a few right down the middle of the chart that are stable. There's some a little ways off the edge that are radioactive, 
but most have only been formed in particle accelerators. Um, oh. So yes, is it just by chance that these decay? So for any particular atom, yeah, it's just by chance, it's just random. Um, and to determine the half-life, you probably cannot predict exactly the half-life just based on the number of protons and neutrons. But you can make estimates of which are going to be most stable, which will have long half-lives, which will have short half-lives, in which you're probably not even gonna be able to make it all, just based on uh, knowing the strong force. And there's all kinds of stuff that's involved in the strong force. It's a very complicated force that's based on distance, but it's also based on the spin of the particles and the isospin. And you have vector forces and tensor forces and all kinds of stuff. So it's a very complicated force. It's not nearly as simple a force as the electromagnetic force. Um, wow. But you can, you, hopefully, or maybe you remember from chemistry that if you have pairs of electrons, they're more stable. Um, if you have just one single electron, for example, in sodium, you have one extra electron in the outer shell, it's very unstable. Yeah. Um, it, it likes to react. Um, and the same is true in the nucleus. An even number of protons or neutrons makes for a very stable nucleus. If you have an odd number of protons or neutrons, then it's much more likely to be an unstable nucleus. And if you look at the chart of the nuclides, uh, you can see that, that you have magic numbers. If you have a full shell, um, then they're much more stable. Wow. Uh, so most people don't worry. About, they know about the shells of electrons in an atom. But in addition, inside the nucleus, you have proton shells and neutron shells. And depending on how those shells fill, you either have a more stable nucleus or a less stable nucleus. Huh. Sorry, that was probably too much. <laughs> It was fascinating. Are you following all that, Paul? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's very 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 interesting. I'm I'm going to play proxy for our listeners, and again, just kind of rewind a bit. And and this is actually something that we covered in our sort of introductory episode to radiometric dating. Um, but you mentioned there the concept of half life, um, and we probably should just sort of remind our listeners, you know, what half life is and. Uh, you know, ha how that works. So, Ben, just, just kind of fill us in on that, if you would, please. Okay, so half-life is the length of time it takes for half of a radioactive atom to decay. So if you have 100 um, uranium atoms, half-life is the amount of time it takes for half of them to decay. However, it gets slightly complicated because you immediately think, well, if that's the time it takes for half to decay, then if you have twice that much time, then all of them will decay. But in fact, it doesn't work quite that way uh, because the number that decay is dependent on the number of atoms that are there. And so, for example, if you have 100 uranium atoms, um, but let, let's use a different example. If you have 100 carbon-14 atoms, half of them will decay in about 5,000 years. So it'll be down to 50 atoms after 5,000 years. But then half of those will decay in the next 5,000 years. So then it'll go down to 25. And then half of those will decay in the next 5,000 years. So it'll be down to 12 or whatever, and then down to six, and then down to three. Uh, so it's exponential uh, rather than just linear. So. Uh, decays by half during each uh, segment of time. So that is odd, because you're right. I would think a yeah. half life <laughs> would be, you know, two half lives, it's gone, right? But it's That's right. not yeah. at all yeah. correct. That is exactly the wrong yeah. way to think about it. Yeah. All right. So, so let me ask you real quick knowledge check here. Do you know the half life of you, of you 238, let's say, uranium 238? To tell you the truth, I Not off the need top to memorize head. all of these, but I just look up on the chart oh, here. So perfect. Uh, it's like, I don't know, I, I'm embarrassed. I don't, don't even have it memorized, but it's something like 10 billion years or something okay. like that. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so question here, very simple question. If it's, if it's, 
that long, if it's millions of years long, <laughs> then there is no one alive today who has observed a complete half-life of uranium, right? So yeah. how can we know that that is the correct half-life of uranium? It seems like we're extrapolating way beyond anything that we could possibly ever hope to observe. So That's true. Um, this one, it would be nice to do something on a chalkboard, ah. but hopefully I can just... Uh, <laughs> Uh, explain it in words. Yeah, there you go. Um, so uh, radioactive decay is exponential. And there's a very simple equation for it that says the number of atoms today is equal to the original number of atoms times E, uh, which is about 2.7, to the negative lambda T. And that is E to an exponent of the decay constant times the time. So there's four unknowns there. The present amount of carbon-14, the original amount of carbon-14, the decay constant or the half-life, and the length of time. So there's four unknowns. Hopefully you remember from algebra that if you can figure out three of those, you can calculate the fourth one. Right. Okay. So uh, I'm just using carbon-14 as an example. It may not be the best example, but people have heard of carbon-14, so I'm using that. That's good. Okay, so if you're able to measure the amount of carbon-14 a year ago and the amount of carbon-14 today, that means you have three of the four unknowns. You have carbon-14 a year ago, carbon-14 today, plus one year. So that, that's your three unknowns. And with those, I mean, your three knowns, and with those three knowns, then you can calculate the decay constant or the half-life. So that's basically all you have to do. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So you don't, you don't have to be around for 5,000 years. You only have to be around for, <laughs> that's good. I mean, the, 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 longer that, uh, the longer time period, the more accurate you can, you can get your decay constant. But as long as you have a large number of atoms, you can get a reasonably good estimate of it. So. Okay. And that is, and, and I will affirm to our, our listeners, that is, that is a very basic algebraic uh, calculation there. You don't need... It's, it's not too hard yet. You don't need differential equations and all the hard the hard math to be able to figure that one out. That that's pretty straightforward. But to to come up with that simple equation, you use some simple calculus to do an integration. Right. Uh, but yeah, you're right. The equation it's just an algebraic equation, and it's easy to solve the algebraic equation. Yeah. You don't need calculus to solve the algebraic yeah. equation. So it all yeah. then, I guess, depends on your ability to measure accurately the decay of some radioactive substance that's right okay yep. okay well then that brings me i guess let's just go right to that question then uh yeah i mean well maybe we should maybe we should step back a second here so what <laughs> as a as geologists and this could be both of you really uh you're both geologists what are the what are the radio radioactive elements and isotopes that you guys are interested that can that people think can tell them stuff about geology? I don't know. What are you What are you guys interested in? <laughs> <laughs> so the one that everybody's heard about, and the one that everybody always asks about, is carbon fourteen. Right. And so people have heard of carbon and that's familiar and carbon decays to nitrogen and most everybody's heard of nitrogen. So, um, so that's one, one pair. Um, another one that people have often heard of, probably most people are uranium and uranium is another very common one that is used for radiometric dating. Uh, today, actually it is probably the uh, preferred method uh, for getting ages on most granitic, and, and some volcanic rocks as well, is uranium decaying to lead. Um, but there are a couple others. They're not quite as popular as common. I'll mention them. Uh, one is rubidium decaying to strontium. Um, it's kind of fallen out of favor and it is, it 
it used to be used a lot, but today it's not used nearly as much as it used to be. Another one is potassium argon. Um, and this is still used uh, for younger volcanic material. It's often used on volcanic ash, um, looking at uh, uh, potassium decaying to argon. Um, there's another me method, it's called the argon-argon method, but it's basically using potassium argon decay. So those are probably the four most common. There's some others, but um, th they're not nearly as common as those four are. Okay, so we, we Paul and I brief recently had an episode where we very briefly discussed carbon fourteen and the fact that it only works on very young things because it has a very short half life, and you don't you're not going to date dinosaurs with it. You're not going to date trilobites with it. Those are things that are conventionally considered to be too old for carbon dating. So where would you where where would you find a uranium a radioactive uranium where where is this where is it happening <laughs> and what what can you reasonably <laughs> use to to date with that method okay um so uranium uh <laughs> some of the various elements preferentially stay in the mantle of the earth other elements preferentially go into the crust of the earth uh, when material melts and crystallizes and so forth, you get this differentiation. And as it turns out, each of the three important um, parent isotopes, uranium, potassium, and rubidium, all preferentially go into the crust of the earth. So you preferentially have these uh, close to the surface where they can be used for dating. Um, and probably the most common rock used for dating is granite. So people have heard of granite. Uh, granite, pretty much all granite will have uranium in it. It will probably have potassium and rubidium in it too. So all three methods could be used to just date any piece of granite. Um, these elements specifically go into certain minerals in the rocks. So rocks are made up of minerals. So for example, granites have um, quartz. People have heard of quartz. Uh, they also have another very common mineral, but maybe people haven't heard of it. It's called feldspar. And there's a big range of different kinds of feldspars. There's alkali feldspars, there's calcium feldspars and so forth. And the alkali feldspars will often have potassium and rubidium. Um, but then there's others, that other minerals that people may not have heard about so much. Biotite and hornblende are two other black minerals that are quite common um, in granites. Not, not as common as quartz and feldspar are, but, but often you'll get biotite and hornblende. And those will have your potassium and rubidium. Um, the mineral that is specifically used for uranium dating most of the time are zircons. And they're a fairly simple mineral. It's a zirconium uh, silicate uh, that has uh, zirconium in it, but zirconium is about the same size and charge as uranium. So uranium can substitute into the crystal lattice in place of the zirconium. So zircons are the preferred method uh, for dating granites and granitic type of rocks. And there's a whole class one could teach about all this stuff. But, oh, yeah, um. I imagine so. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, so, okay, so rocks are made of minerals. And minerals are, can you, can you help us understand what is the difference there? Mineral is, what is a mineral? So a mineral generally has a very specific ratio between the different atoms in it. So it has a certain number of oxygen atoms, a certain number of silicon atoms, a certain number of calcium or sodium or potassium atoms. And it has a specific crystal lattice. So they're all arranged very nicely in a lattice. And so you have fairly constant okay. ratios of the different um, 
atoms inside the mineral, whereas a rock can have quite a range of, of compositions. So something like a granite uh, are granitic kinds of rocks. There's, there's a whole range of granitic kinds of rocks. It can have 0% quartz or 20% quartz or 40% quartz. That's not too common, but up to 20, 30, sometimes 40% quartz. Uh, and you have a, quite a range of potassium feldspar versus your plagioclase feldspar. So you have a big range of, of composition. So rocks don't have specific ratios, whereas minerals have fairly specific ratios um, of the different atoms inside them. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> I, think I'm, I think I'm following this. Man. Maybe, maybe Paul can make a comment on that. As, uh, <laughs> Clarifying for the audience. <laughs> I, I yeah. So, so no. Go ahead, Todd. No, I was just. Okay. I don't know what I'm talking about, Paul. You want to okay. chime in on some of this stuff too? <laughs> well, uh, I think Ben's explained things extremely clearly. Okay, so, great. Uh, yeah. So, so, so <laughs> <Okay>. rocks. <laughs> so, so rocks are composed of these various minerals and we have these particular elements which are relevant to um, dating which are incorporated into those minerals when they crystallize out from for example in the case of a granite from a magma okay. from a melt and uh, those radioactive um, isotopes are incorporated into those minerals and they form the basis for being able to then date the formation of those uh, rocks or even particular minerals within the rock. Um, so, yeah, just to try and simplify things a bit. For, okay, well. For the, for the listener. <laughs> there you go. All right, so, so walk us through something like this. Walk us through a geological date. I'm assuming it's not dinner in a movie. You're going to find a rock and you want to date it so what actually do you do? Uh, okay, I'll go through some of the, some of the steps okay. fairly quickly. Uh, so we're working down in Peru, looking at the granites and the Andes in Peru. And um, basically, it's pretty simple. We drive along the road, and here's a road crut, and there's some nice fresh rock there. And we stop the vehicle beside the road and go pound on the rock with our rock hammer or our, often a sledgehammer. We take a sledgehammer along and that makes it a little bit easier. And we just take a hand sized sample and say, okay, if we want to get the date on this sample. So we just pick it up and put it in a bag and bring it back to the lab. Uh, but what we want to do is get the zircons out of this granite. Now, all granitic rocks don't have zircons, but most of them do. We found pretty much all of them have zircons. Uh, so we crush the rock down to gravel size, and then we crush it some more to get the sizes we expect, maybe down to um, a tenth of a millimeter or a couple tenths of a millimeter. Um, but there's lots of different minerals in that granite, and we want to separate the zircons from the rest of them. And so the different minerals have different magnetic properties. And so we have a rather expensive machine that we purchased just a couple years ago, uh, a magnetic separator that will help separate the different, the non, well, the, 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 the different minerals have slightly different magnetic properties. And so it will separate some minerals based on the mineral properties. Uh, so that helps a little bit and we get, more and more refined samples. But then the next step is zircons are fairly heavy, have a high density in comparison with some of the others. So quartz and feldspars are lower density, zircons are higher density. And so we put these little particles, these little crystals in a heavy liquid and quartz and feldspar will flow to the surface of the heavy liquid Whereas zircons and some other stuff like apatite crystals will sink to the bottom. And so this helps a lot. And this, we, we can get mostly zircons in, but then finally we have to look at them and uh, 
take those ones that look like zircons out. We put it on a little epoxy disc and um, then we image it. We, we get various pictures of it, not just with a microscope, but also um, with uh, cathodoluminescence, CL imaging and so forth. And that helps us determine whether it's actually zircons or, you know, some of them are appetite. You can tell by, by looking at these images to figure out which, which it is. So then we want to get the uranium and lead atoms out of this zircon. So we zap it with a laser beam and you get all kinds of stuff out in, in a gas. Um, and then you accelerate it uh, in a plasma, in an electric field uh, with, with a plasma. And then you run it through a mass spectrometer that has uh, magnets in it, basically like the magnets, magnets in the old TV screens that um, uh, took an electron beam and swished it across the front, front of your uh, TV screen, you know, many times per second. Um, and so the heavier atoms aren't bent as easily in the magnetic field. The lighter atoms are bent more easily. So lead is lighter than uranium is. So it's bent more easily. And so you get a whole spread of these and you can count the uranium atoms and you can count the lead atoms. And um, then you take the ratio between them and put them in that simple equation that I told you about uh, mm -hmm. for radioactive decay. You put it in that equation um, and you can calculate how old it's supposed to be using that equation. So that's kind of the steps. That's it. Huh? So do you, <laughs> that's it. Yeah. There, there's all kinds of little tricks to it. Yeah, so it, sure. it's, uh, yeah. to, to get it to work right. But, yeah. um, but how, basically, how, yeah. How precise are these measurements, Ben? You know, when you, when you say you're counting the, the, the uranium atoms and, you know, uh, how, how precisely are we able to do that? Um, if you are counting thousands or tens of thousands of atoms per second, uh, you're counting individual ones. Once you're counting into millions or billions of atoms per second, then you're counting a current. It's like an, an ammeter. If you just, uh, connect up to a wire that has electricity running through it, then you're counting, you know, billions or whatever, tens of billions of electrons per second. Uh, so then you're counting a current, but, but the, the measurements are, are pretty accurate. You can get pretty accurate on it. So, yeah. So it's great. So we're able to do this with really quite a high degree of precision. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, actually when we come up with ages, um, we, we get ages that usually are considered to be accurate to about 1%. So, um, you know, sometimes they're not that good. Uh, if we, we have not used the more detailed techniques, but if you use some very careful techniques that are much more expensive, uh, expensive, uh, you can get maybe to a 10th of a percent accuracy, something like that. So, wow. Whew. Okay. So a couple of questions here. You mentioned something called, you mentioned driving along and coming to a fresh road cut. Is there a reason you like fresh road cuts? Couldn't you just pick up oh. a rock along the road and <laughs> go with that? Does it need to be fresh? Um, it, it, it depends on what you're doing, whether you're doing the uranium lead or if you're doing the potassium argon. Potassium argon uh, dating is often done on biotites and horn blends. And those are very easily altered. Um, you can have groundwater moving through the rocks mm -hmm. and, and altering your minerals like biotite and hornblende quite easily. Yeah. Uh, they have low closure temperatures. So if they're heated up a little bit, um, that can mess them up as well. It can change the number of atoms inside the, the um, mineral. On the other hand, uh, zircons have a very high closure temperature. They, um, it's about 900, 1000 degrees Celsius, something like that. Uh, and so probably they are not nearly as likely to be altered by um, later low temperature events. Okay. And so we've actually dated uh, rocks that are altered, but they have zircons in them and the zircons 
we figure probably have not been altered and, and we feel like we've gotten good ages from them. But in general, we, we try to get fresh rocks, yes. Yeah. Uh, in one case, we weren't able to get a fresh one, so we just use an altered one. But, but in most cases, we try to get ones that there's no evidence in a hand sample that it's altered. And, and sometimes or, or often we'll take thin sections and look at the thin sections under a microscope and, and we can tell whether it's been altered or not. So, okay. so next question then, what, what heavy liquid will cause quartz to float? What is that actual liquid? Ah, uh, for a long time, they used very toxic stuff like um, bromine, yeah. uh, your uh, iodine kind of stuff are, are heavy liquids. Okay. Now they use um, tungsten, uh, a, a tungsten liquid that, that's uh, based on tungsten. So, oh, wow. uh, okay. And it has a variable density depending on how warm it is, how hot it is. Uh, and you can add water to it and that'll change its density. So, so you have these heavy liquids that you can adjust their density to whatever you need so that some stuff will float and some stuff will sink. But it's really expensive stuff. So the, the tungsten stuff is not so toxic, but it's extremely expensive. The bromine and the iodine stuff it's not quite as expensive, but it's pretty toxic stuff. So it mm. kind of is a trade-off. Uh, and I think both are still used. Yeah. Uh, so Okay. I was, wonder I was yeah. wondering about that. I was wondering if it was bromine. I remember yeah. Yeah, a, a, as a undergraduate first encountering bromine in uh, the lab and in the chemistry lab and picking up the bottle. It was a small bottle, right? Just a little small bottle, but it felt like I just picked up a thing of lead. It was so heavy. Um, so <laughs> if, if our listeners or viewers are wondering, what is this heavy liquid? Yeah, there is. It is really weird. Imagine picking up a coffee cup <laughs> and having it just completely full of lead. That would be the experience of some of these heavy liquids. They are they are literally heavy. Um, well, I assume when you picked up that bottle, it had all kinds of warnings on it. Oh, yes. <laughs> terrible stuff and <laughs> so yeah. yeah yeah bromine is caustic it will burn you um, yeah. yeah don't want to mess with it okay that oh, my goodness so do you do all of that or do you can you like call up a company and say hey i collected some granite will you do this date or do you do you run this stuff in in a lab by can you can you literally, Ben Clausen, walk into a lab and do all this stuff? Is that in your skill set? Um, so at, at times we have just sent our samples off to a commercial lab to, to have them analyzed. Um, more often we have done quite a few of the steps ourselves. Wow. Uh, the procedure for getting the zircons out is a very time consuming process. Um, and I and a student went completely through this process one time uh, just for our own information. And so we knew what all the steps were. So, yes, we have done it all ourselves. Wow. Uh, it costs a little bit for the equipment, but we have purchased all the equipment here. And so now we are able to do the, our own zircon separation. Wow. The other step is having a mass spectrometer to measure them. Mm -hmm. And we do not have... Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the equipment for that, it's fairly expensive. I don't know, 500000 a million dollars, something yeah. like that. But that's only part of the issue. The other part is you have to have somebody who knows what they're doing uh, to run it. And there's all kinds of little tricks to getting it all to run right. right. Um, so we have worked at um, uh, mass spectrometer labs uh, half a dozen times or so uh, where it's a user facility. And so there's people there that know how to run it, but they have us come in, we bring our samples in, they tell us what to do and we run our own samples. Oh. Um, and I've taken students there. They're wonderful to work with. They've been very good to work with. Our most recent one was just a few months ago. Uh, we got some very nice results about a month ago. The people there said, we're always happy to have you work with us. We're looking forward to when you're coming back the next time. 
Um, so I, I would emphasize that, that the lab that we use, um, it's very, very good people to work with. And, and we feel like they do an absolutely excellent job of what they're doing there. So, wow. Ben, when you um, run these kinds of dating determinations on rock samples or on mineral samples, um, do you usually apply just one of these radiometric dating techniques or do you apply multiple techniques to the same samples? Um, and a kind of corollary to that is um, if you do run multiple different radiometric dating determinations on the rocks, do you get consistent results? Um, do you see any patterns that kind of come out of the data? Um, so when we uh, do the zircon dating, uh, zircons have uranium in them, but uranium has two different important isotopes. About 99% is uranium-238, but about 1%, a little bit less than 1%, is U-235. So both of those are measured. And the decay product are lead isotopes. And so we, we measure the lead isotopes as well as the uranium and compare them. And uh, so the question is, do the two different uranium isotopes agree with each other? And sometimes they don't, but we have found that probably 90, 95% of the time they do agree with each other and so those are the ages that are used. And if they don't agree with each other, um, there, there's often some good explanation for it, why, why they don't. Um, so that's one thing. Just within the uranium lead dating system itself, there's two different ones that we compare. Uh, and that's usually what we do is just the zircon dating. However, we have also uh, done some argon-argon dating and we've also done a little bit of rubidium strontium. And we find it that we come up with approximately the same ages uh, using all three of those techniques. Um, and the other methods, each one is quite expensive to do. And so we don't do a lot of each of the different ones because uh, it just plain costs a lot of money. But in general, we have found consistency between the different methods. And in addition, uh, the ages we get uh, we probably don't need to do this, but often we will redate a sample that's been dated like 20, 30, 40 years ago, just to check whether we're going to get the same results as they did before. And we don't necessarily get exactly the same, but it's amazing how close it is. In general, when we redo it, so, in fact, sometimes I say, I probably shouldn't have done that one because we already have an age for it. So why did we do it over again? because we basically get the same age when we run it as, as is in the literature from 20, 30 years ago. So, so that it seems to be pretty consistent, yeah. yeah. And that's a really important observation because there's this sort of high degree of replicability yeah. um, in, in terms of the dates that you can, you can generate from, from these rocks. So that's an important observation. It's something we need to, to think about yeah. and be able to explain. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So 20 to 30 years ago, I mean, that's, I don't think people really understand. There's, I would imagine there has been some, it, it, certainly in my field, there have been significant advancements in technology and ability to measure and study things. Is that the case in, in physics as well, in geophysics? Well, very, very much, yeah. yeah. So uh, 20 or 30 years ago, uh, let, let's say 30 years ago. In Peru, they, they had a lot of uranium lead ages, but they used whole rock instead of individual mineral mm -hmm. ages. Um, so now that we're using individual minerals, we're able to get uh, better results. But they are still amazingly close to what they got 30 years ago. In addition, 30 years ago, they would often use potassium argon or rubidium strontium um, and people don't like those anymore. In fact, one guy that I work with says, I, I don't even trust any of the potassium argon or rubidium strontium ages. And I understand why he says that, and I agree with him, but I'm still amazed at how close these old ages are to what the uranium lead ages they got and the uranium lead ages that we got. You know, they're not, they're not perfect, but they're, you know, within... 
ten percent in most cases, uh, something like that. So yeah, so they're not wildly. They're they're not, not wildly different. Crazily, no. crazy different. Okay. Yeah. Um, sometimes, actually, sometimes they are crazy different, but just by looking at the rock, you can see that it's been altered, and then you say, well, mm -hmm. obviously it's different because it, it it's been yeah. altered. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, so you can yeah. tell. So, okay. So that's, you know, Paul brought up a really important point here because that's a thing, that's a theme that I hear a lot in creationism that, that uh, you know, creationists will publish these dates that are clearly, um, <laughs> clearly not right, right? They'll, they'll get millions of years on a recent lava flow that we know is recent or they will get, mm -hmm. you know, dates that are hundreds of millions of years off with different methods in the same rock. And I don't want to, I don't doubt that that's a real result, but you, yeah, I, you seem true. to be telling me that that's not usually what happens. You know, sometimes we get that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. uh, but most of the time, no. Um, most of the time you get results that make really good sense. Just by looking at the contact relations between the rocks, you can tell which one is older and which one is younger. Sure. And then you get the same kind of results in, with the radiometric ages. It's not perfect, but it it's amazing how often it, it works very nicely. So. Huh. Yeah. So in effect, there's a, there's a trend that rocks, which we know are older from other kinds of geological evidence, give older radiometric ages than younger rocks. And so we have this sort of broad trend <clears throat> that um, although there's some scatter, you know, there are some points that kind of don't lie on the line. Mm -hmm. Basically, you're seeing a trend that kind of makes geological sense. So, so and again, that's important. Back, back to Peru, uh, where we've where we've done the most work. Uh, there are rocks that are known to be Precambrian, and we have collected a few samples and done ages on those, and we agree that the ages we come up with are Precambrian. And by contact relations, you can see which ones are more recent. And so in Eastern Peru, the Eastern Cordillera has uh, Permian Triassic, which are about in the middle of the main part of the geologic column. And we've done some dating on that. I have one student who's working in Eastern Peru and we have a dozen, maybe a couple dozen uh, ages from, from Eastern Peru. And we do get up we do get the ages expected for those Permian Triassic, which are generally considered to be, um, oh, what is that? 250 million, I guess, something like that. Uh, most of our work has been in the uh, Peru coastal batholith, which, which is Cretaceous. And those ages are on the order of 80, 100, some occasionally we get them a little bit older than 100, but uh, most of those ages are young. And by contact relations uh, with sedimentary rocks that have fossils in them, uh, they were originally determined to be approximately that age. And in general, that's what we get. It's not perfect, but, you know, most of the time it, it seems to work pretty well. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. in addition, we, we also got some from... Um, some volcanic samples that are right at the top of the geologic column. And those are supposed to be um, Miocene, Pliocene, five, 10 million years old, something like that. And we got detrital zircons, these little basically sand grains uh, in these. And, and we did some zircon ages on those. And yeah, those were, we got the same kind of results with detrital zircons in the um, in the sediments as well. So, oh, wow. So, <laughs> so I've had people, you know, go and I speak at a church or whatever, and I've had people tell me that that this that this radiometric dating is a lot of speculation. You get you get all these crazy ages, and then the geologist is just biased by evolution and just goes picks out the age that he likes, uh, and then that's it. That does not sound like what you're describing to me at all. You, <laughs> you seem to be fairly confident that these are reasonable experimental results and measurements 
that are not simply the, the, the result of somebody just um, imposing their evolutionary bias onto the fossil record. Would you say that that sounds right to you? <laughs> I think possibly 50 years ago when they were first developing the techniques, uh, you, you might have gotten some of that where people oh, okay. were biased or where, where you got a bunch of problematic dates and people didn't know how to explain them and so forth. So I, I think that if you use material from 50 years ago, that's very possible. But the latest techniques now, I think uh, the geochronology community has come to understand um, the different techniques much better. And I actually am very impressed with the people I work with in the geochronology community that they're doing an excellent job. Hmm. And they're, they're not trying to, in fact, I've had some of them tell me, you know, we don't wake up in the morning just trying to figure out how to overthrow Christianity and, and disprove God and so forth. They, they, they know I'm a Christian. They know I'm, uh, I'm interested. I, I believe what the Bible says. Um, and they say, you know, we're, we're not out to destroy faith. They, they really make a point of that. We're, we're not out to destroy faith. We're just interested in understanding how the world works. Yeah. So, um, and because I am interested in the same thing, uh, they're happy to work with me. And they say, you know, um, actually one guy I work with that's become a really good friend of mine, uh, when he first said he wanted to work with me, I said, yeah, that'd be great. He was a kind of a well-known guy. And then I, the next day we were at some meetings. So the next day he came by and said, well, I, you know, I'm not sure whether I want to work with you or not. I did a Google search on your name and it said, creationist, creationist, creationist. So I'm not sure I want to work with you. And I told him, you know, I can understand your concern that uh, sometimes creationists get a really bad name, uh, but I'm anxious to do the good science. And uh, then I gave him my CV that had a couple dozen nuclear physics publications on it. And he said, no, I'm happy to work with you. And so as long as we're doing good science, I think the scientific community is, is happy, to, happy to work together. And um, I've had a really good relationship with him and, and we've worked together for the last 10, 12 years, I guess, something like that. And had some, gotten some good publications out um, and become really good friends too, so. Wow, that's, that's fantastic. That's not a story you hear a lot about. I think, I think just in yeah. general, people have still the idea that there's this giant war and that the only way creationists can interact with anyone else is through conflict and battle. And it's it's very yeah. refreshing to hear that yeah. it doesn't have to be that way. Um, it doesn't. You're right. Yeah. 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 Oh. It's fantastic. Well, uh, yeah. So in our quest to understand radiometric dating here on our mm -hmm. podcast, it sounds like we got a lot of work to do. We got a, we got a work cut out for us. It does not sound like this is going to be an easy thing to solve. Would you say that's right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm a strong believer in the Bible, in, in what Genesis has to say. But I also believe that God speaks to us through nature and we need to listen carefully. And in the process, we need to treat people well. We need to trust them and respect them. Um, I mean, there, there's a few bad apples in the scientific community, just like there's bad apples in the Christian community. Yeah. But I would say, you know, 99% of my interactions in the scientific community have been very positive, and I have very good relations in the scientific community, and I'm very appreciative of the people that I work with there. Wow. So. Wow. Well, Paul, do you have any other questions for him before we wrap it up here? Uh, well, I I think this has been a, a, a fascinating um, discussion. And I think I just want to reiterate something that we, we've said before as we've sort of embarked on this uh, series about radiometric dating, which is that, you know, if, if you're tuning into this episode, um, we are not trying to solve all of the problems of radiometric dating <laughs> right here and now in this episode. It's that 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 is just too big a task. Um, what we're trying to do um, is carefully understand what the data are 
and what needs to be explained. And it's been absolutely fantastic to be able to talk to somebody who has expertise in these areas and who has actually uh, been involved in the dating of rocks and understands the procedures involved and some of the complexities and also some of the incredible consistencies that we see in the data as, as a result. And if we're going to be um, good scientists, we need to understand um, not only what the anomalies are, um, which is often what people want to focus on, um, but we also need to understand the consistencies and the trends and the patterns. And we need to be able to explain all, all of the data. And that's an enormous um, task. That's not something we're going to solve in this series, but we want to begin to explore um, the, these questions and help our listeners to, uh, to understand them. So I'm really grateful, Ben, for your, for your time. I think it's been a, a fantastic discussion and you've you've really helped us to sort of clarify some of our thoughts and i hope our listeners uh, agree and perhaps we can talk to you again sometime as well as we as we continue to explore these topics it's been a real pleasure to talk to both of you thank you very much yeah well, thank you all right well thank you for listening all of you listening or watching on youtube uh this uh, podcast is brought to you by uh, Core Academy of Science and Biblical Creation Trust. You can find out more about the podcast at coreside.org slash podcast. That's C-O-R-E-S-C-I dot O-R-G slash podcast. Uh, you can contact us through the various social media platforms. You know what they are. And you can also email us at podcast at coreside.org. Uh, the sponsoring organizations, Core Academy, we are at coresci.org, and you can find out more about us at coresci.org slash connect. That'll give you uh, links to uh, important content that we think you ought to be reading and uh, also our social media presence. And you'll find a link there to a page where you can make a contribution to help us continue to bring you this podcast. Paul, tell us about Biblical Creation Trust. Yes, you can find us at biblicalcreationtrust.org and uh, we're also on various social media platforms including Facebook and you can find us there. And if you'd like to um, help support the work um, on our homepage, uh, there is a donate button and you can click on that and it takes you to all of the options to be able to give to the work of BCT. All right. Well, Paul, I don't know that we know what's coming up next, but I'm sure it's going to be a load of fun, whatever it is. Yep. Um, we always have a good, I always have a good time recording these. I, I love learning new things. And yep. this is, this one's been really an eye opener for me. I really appreciated it. So I hope to see you Absolutely. all back here again in two weeks when we have another episode of Let's Talk Creation. Yep. See you then. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Let's Talk Creation. If you have questions, send them to podcast at coreside.org. That's P-O-D-C-A-S-T at C-O-R-E-S-C-I dot org. And be sure to let your friends know about Let's Talk Creation. And check us out on social media. Thank you. <laughs>